Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. Tonight, an oral history interview with Virginia Adder Keys. Virginia was a radio and television personality in Jacksonville for many years. Here's our interview with Virginia Adder Keys, recorded at WJXT TV4. You were at Channel 4 at the very beginning. Yeah, the very beginning in the 1950s. Actually, it was 1950. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, singing at the Roosevelt Hotel with a band. They I live in Jacksonville, of course. And someone heard me and said, you should be on TV. And I said, really, here? You said, you said what's that? I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> I said, OK, what does it pay? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. He said, you should be on TV. We're starting the television station, and we're looking for performers. And would you like, were you interested? And I said, sure. And that's how it started. And it was from the beginning, stand here. There's a microphone here like five miles up, and you stand here, and we give you a signal, and when we give you the signal, you talk, and when we give you this, that means shut up. I thought, gee, that sounds great. They're telling me what to do. <laughs> so that's how we started. And you were singing. I was uh, singing. 15-minute show at did, night now. Did you continue your singing career in addition to working oh, at, yes, at the station? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, yes. I sang at the Roosevelt Hotel, and the show was at, it started at 11 o'clock at night, and then they gave me one at 7 in the evening, and then one in the, the morning. And how the morning started, show started, when one day someone came up to me on the, while I was singing and said, that was, a, that was a good song, I like that. And I said, who are you? And they said, well, I'm going to, I'm just in town, and I'm representing the station, I wanted to tell you that's a very good idea. And someone said, you know, we should do a talk show. Well, you can sit down and talk to someone. I said, what about singing? Well, you can sing if you want to, but it's a talk show. So that's how that started with maybe we can just sit and talk to someone, see how that works. And the thing that we have to remember is that you were kind of inventing television because there hadn't been any television before in Jacksonville. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, we didn't, we didn't know what was going on. The camera on us. We didn't have a, um, a TV set, a monitor. We had no idea what we looked like, how my hair was, what my makeup was like. The camera was there and we talked. And we were not interested in anything except the guests that, that, that we had at the moment. That was it. And we always need to remember it was live television. Oh, well, well we didn't think, we didn't know anything else. Yeah, there was no, nothing no, else. No, we didn't know what else they would <laughs> possibly do. You know, that came much later. But this was all live. Oh, yeah. Now, when did radio come along in your career? Was, uh, you, were, you did I TV was, first. Oh, I did radio for many, many years. Uh -huh. I attended school in the downtown, the Backlit Conception, da -da -da, <laughs> for many, many years. And I sang in the beautiful church on the corner, if you remember that entire block. Mm -hmm. And someone heard me sing one day and said, oh, that was beautiful. Would you like to sing on radio? And then, yeah, I love to sing on radio. So it was like it was the Roosevelt Hotel, which was the Carling Hotel then, and they gave me a show, a 15-minute show. And the the show emanated from the hotel. From the hotel. Uh -huh. Oh, I thought that was really it. You know, I was. Singing. And that was WJAX. Oh yes, the that was the city old station, yes. and so I walked from our house to the station and do my show. And I sang like three or four songs, and it was all ad lib. There was nothing prepared. It was Where was the radio station? Well, the radio station was right down on Main Street. As a matter of fact, that building I think is still there. Mm -hmm. Beautiful building, and they had many shows. Their children's programs. Uh, it was the big station owned by the city, mm -hmm. and that was my first uh, big, I thought, break. And of course, how, how did you, uh, did you have any interest uh, in radio or television or did it, it just came along? I sang. I sang at the Roosevelt Hotel yeah. when I was very, very young. They had amateur shows and I was always standing in line. And one day the performer, Harvey Bell, was very famous in Jacksonville. He said, why don't you work here a couple nights a week? I said, oh, well, I attend the Immaculate Conception School. I don't know if my mother and father, well, as long as you, we, we give you a morning, I mean, we give you an, a very early show, 8 o'clock, and then you'd be home, you know, mm -hmm. by 9 o'clock. 
So I started at the Roosevelt Hotel and walked home after every show. And then, then during the summer, I worked many hours then. And it just was really turned out in the war and all of that. Did you have any training to sing, or did it just Never. come natural? No, and because when you attend a parochial school, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> the nuns taught you to sing, you sang, and you knew, and they taught you how to sing, how to hold a note. But it, it was always something I enjoyed doing as a child. Uh, I wanted to always sing, and I think they realized that I would stand there and listen and learn, and they needed that in children in those days. How many radio stations were there at that time? Oh, J WJAX was a city-owned station. It was the only station? That's the only one I remember. Okay. Because there you could stand in line and wait until they said, you're on, and uh, it didn't cost you a dime, then you'd walk home. So, uh, and you... Uh, Born in Jacksonville? I was born in Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Uh, my parents were born in Lebanon. Are you familiar with Lebanon? Mm -hmm. Beautiful country. And uh, they came to this country, and Mama, and they had seven children. And they left Gardner, Massachusetts, where I was born. And my brother contracted polio there during the polio epidemic. And someone said, oh, there's a wonderful hospital in Florida, and uh, maybe they can help somehow. Mm -hmm. So we moved to Jacksonville and uh, he did get a lot of help there and he also went to Shriners Hospital for crippled children. They were great. The Shriners were really there for him. Mm -hmm. So we went through all of that which is good for a family to see that life isn't so perfect and it, we have to all help. And we helped him. He became uh, quite a young man in the city of Jacksonville. He worked yeah. for the city. You know Flip. They called so him Flip. Worked for the city. For, for the really. city for many, many years. And then I started in television the first day it started. They, they you know, I said, I can sing. And they said, good. And then can you sell? And do you want to, you know, then it just moved up to whatever you could do. You tried. You actually tried on the air because mm -hmm. nobody cared as long as you had TV and there was one station. Oh, Stratton said that one day, boy, everybody knows us. Everywhere we go, everybody knows us. Right. And then it dawned on us, you know, it's the only station, they have to watch us. Oh. Now, we have to remember that uh, no one had a TV set. Why would they? Because there was we no TV We didn't have station. one. We didn't have so a TV the, station. So the first mission, I think, was to get people to buy a TV oh, set so they could watch. Absolutely. And the, um, they were so willing to work with us. Matter of fact, they gave, they didn't give me a set, but they put one in the house so that I would understand when I sang my songs and did the commercial what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So they, they said, come on, you, you have a TV set. You know, now you know what you're talking about. And boy, we were so excited. We said, they don't realize they're never going to get that set back. A lot of people are going to remember Dick Stratton. Oh, uh, yes. Let's, let's talk about him. Uh, was he, at, when did he come along at Channel 4? He came and in, in, he was interested in sports. Mm -hmm. That was it. And he was very attractive to begin with. And he started, John Piombo was very important in those days, who uh, worked selling cars mm -hmm. uh, in town. They became friends. And uh, then all of a sudden they said, we should be doing a sports show on television. Uh, and so they, you know, they started a sports show, and then they started televising the baseball games, the football games. It was always John and Dick Stratton. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the thing, something new, something exciting. And Dick was just into it up to here now. He didn't care about anything else. And he stayed with it to the very end of his life. And you worked with Dick uh, on other kinds of shows, like there was a midday show and... and things of that kind. One day he, he, I was doing the show, uh, singing and then selling, and he sat down with me. And it was it's kind of a cute combination. And we started talking, and Glenn Marshall, who was the manager then, said, you know, I, I think that'd be a good combination <laughs> for the two of them. Right. And so everyone thought we were going together, Dumb, you know, going mm -hmm. together. And I said, oh dear, I think Dick, they think we're going together. But he did introduce me to my husband, I will say that. That wow. was over 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. He said, I've got a guy I want you to meet. I think you'll like him. And I liked him. We got married, and Dick stood up for us. And 
he stayed our friend to the very end. Mm -hmm. But everyone thought, oh, you dummy. You could have married Dick Stratton. And, I mean, we were like, he was like a brother. You know, that's, that's the kind of friendship and love we had for uh -huh. each other. And uh, when he passed away, it was family. Yeah. I still think of him, go by the graveside. I told mm -hmm. you, I still do that today. And then one day they said, you want to do a commercial? At where you take this bottle here and you just say, it's a cold, cold bottle of water. Man, am I thirsty. You know, and you go through all, take a sip and say, there's nothing like crystal, how do you pronounce that? Geister? Gister? Huh? Geyser. Geyser. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, I, maybe they'll send us a check. But that's what, you know, we did. It was very, very normal. Someone said, hey, maybe we better start selling. And in those days, it was Cohen Brothers, the top department store in Jacksonville. Do you want a talk sh Not a talk show, just a show doing commercials. Just different uh, spots, you know, the, anything you want to talk about. Clothes, uh, goods, uh, kitchen, uh, anything. Anything to do with anything in the store, we'll sell. So they tried it. That's how it started. And we were in the store with the microphones uh, selling shirts and selling ties and selling just for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then someone said, let's do it in the studio. Brought the stuff in the studio. Let's do it for 20 minutes. Let's do it for then a half hour. And then someone said, well, bring someone from the store. One day I sat with a lady. She said, I work in the store. I'm a saleswoman. I said, forget that. Just talk, just the way we do every day. And she said, okay. And so she started, yeah, that's that's great top. It's only 19.99, and they started buying, honey. They started buying some spots on, t on TV. It was fabulous. And some uh, businessmen decided that uh, they wanted to be on TV, of course. And they, so they, some of them started doing their own commercials. Right? Yeah, sometimes it was good. Sometimes <laughs> not, yeah. Sometimes they were a little, well, they all thought they could do it because they owned the store. Sure. It was their money. It mean, I mean, it was their, they were the chief. You know, I'm the chief. They mm. all know me. But once that light hit them, pow, they would go, Ugh! <laughs> And they'd watch themselves on TV and think, my gosh, I'm on TV. And they'd say, oh. Ah, how you doing, buddy? You know, they get scared, and then they, you know, then it was a different thing. But if then when they started taping, it was, you know, then they could stop and do it over mm -hmm. again. But live, if they ever saw themselves, that was the end. So they had to keep all the TV sh TV cameras away from, I mean, the, right, the sets, just, yeah. the sets away from them. And then they were they were good. Some of them were natural and could come on, and then others were frightened but wanted to try so but it was interesting mm -hmm. to see them uh, at least try and uh, let, let's talk a little more about uh, Dick Stratton the other thing that you uh, that people would remember of course is the uh, connection between Dick and the Florida Gators uh, he was definitely a uh, an orange and blue uh, he was the greatest supporter the most interesting man Everything he felt for them was from the heart. He gave his time, he gave his money, you know, he would take his money and spend it on anything just to be sure that it was promoted right. Mm -hmm. That was his heart, the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for years and years he did the, uh, the Sunday uh, recap of the Florida Gator game that had taken place the day before on Sunday. Yes. He was it was i think it was good harry because it was sincere mm -hmm. i mean it was you know most guys most guys they'll say here's a script doesn't know a thing about it he studies the script i'm not saying this to, to every man or woman but a, a lot of us i did it too you know you, you're in a hurry they said here's a script you have a minute and you do your thing but dick knew so much about the university of florida he loved the school it was in his heart when he talked about the school he wasn't kidding. He wasn't, it wasn't phony. It was from the heart. The team was from the heart. That was what he was good. He wasn't just promoting. It was from the heart. You're watching an oral history interview with Virginia Adder Keys. We'll have more of our interview after this.
The Jacksonville Historical Society, preserving your city's history, protecting your city's treasures, advocating the restoration of Jacksonville landmarks, archiving a century of historical documents, collecting rare photographs, tens of thousands, creating the Merrill Museum House, piece by piece, restoring Old St. Andrew's Church, receiving Florida Historical Society's top honors, publishing historical books, elegantly crafted, producing video histories, dramatically told, educating our citizens for decades, enlightening the generations to come, sponsoring tonight's special television presentation, and offering you the opportunity to become a part of Jacksonville history. Call 665-0064, visit jackshistory.com, and become a member of the Jacksonville Historical Society, celebrating 80 years serving our community. Now back to our interview with Virginia Adder Keys. Uh, we interviewed George Runneling uh, Love recently. Love him. Love uh, George. Everybody loves George. Yay, yeah, yay, yeah, yay. Yeah. What, what are your recollections of George? Uh, when he first came, uh, yeah, I was like a little boy. We said, well, very youthful, very youthful person. and very shy. And he stood in the corner and we said, who is he? And they said, he's going to be a meteorologist. Yep. And we said, the weatherman. <laughs> and they gave us that dumb word. And we said, "How? why do we have to say meteor? They said, you have to say it. You can't say weatherman. So I said to Dick, you say it. And he said, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I said, you can say it. He said, I'm not going to say it. I said, well, say, well just say weatherman. Yeah. So that was a big joke because George was so classy. And he was willing to do anything. If you told him to come in and talk to you, he would. If you wanted to talk about the weather, then it, certainly you'll talk about the weather. But he did it the smart way. He became known as a kind, gentle, easygoing guy. And then he gradually moved into, what do you think about today's weather? Mm -hmm. What's it going to be like tomorrow? Well, what about what's happening in New York? Is that something, you know, and on and on it went until then it was George in the weather. And he took it, loved it, handled it, did it right. It was not a phony. What he said was what he studied. And what he said on the air is what he knew. He wasn't a phony in any way. And after an amazing 47 years, he's kind of uh, semi-retired. He's still. He'll, I bet you he does the same thing I do, and that is he talks about it. He probably goes all over the place with a stick, saying, "Well, I bet you." And his wife says, "All <laughs> right, already," because I walk around the house and I say, Picture a penthouse way up in the sky. That was my theme song. That was your song. theme song, yeah. And Jim says, all right already. <laughs> so they have to put up with us. Mm -hmm. When you go through these years, they have to let us slowly get out of it. We don't stop. We have to gradually move out. But the poor guy or the poor wife that has to wait for us to go through it have to suffer. So they either love us enough <laughs> Oh, it's too bad. Now, if you look at television today in 2009, uh, it's hard to imagine how much local programming there was in the early days. There were networks, but stations like Channel 4 had an awful lot of pro local programs, live shows, and ent entertainment shows, shows. Absolutely. I mean, we went everywhere. As long as we had a microphone, and one camera and one man, we could travel. We didn't have a truck or a car or, a, I mean, a car, yes. Mm -hmm. We'd put everything in maybe two cars. We went, every, we'd go to the small towns like Callahan mm -hmm. or Valdosta. We didn't care. We'd travel anywhere to do the show. But today, it's, it's so great what they're able to do and the help they have and what TV has become. But in those days, you did what you could do with what you had. And people were so excited. And w w we were stars, mister. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, wherever we went. And one day I told you the story. And that, uh, Dick said, we're stars. And I said, there's only one station. <laughs> they have to watch us. That was my song. There was only one station for a long time. Oh, right? forever. We loved it. Now, we were stars. <laughs> Channel 4, uh, as we sit here, Channel 4 uh, signed on 60 years ago this week. 
Has it been and, 60 uh, years? Oh, it was, yeah. uh, I yes, think, it was. another eight, eight years or so before Channel 12 came along. Oh, yeah. And we welcomed them. We were nice about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we said, okay, they can come in if they want to. <laughs> we'll let uh, them in. But uh, the station did, shall we say, have a, a, a quite a good head start. Oh, before. are you kidding? Yeah. A head start? Yeah. <laughs> they started, well, they were, it was so beautifully put together. They came in as stars. Mm -hmm. Because they had watched TV and knew what was going on. We went on. We had no so idea. They had a role model, which uh, you didn't I, have. I hope. You know, I'm sure that they watched other stations from other, you know, mm -hmm. states. I don't know. We had, we had nothing to, mm -hmm. to, you know, to say, well, we can follow his advice or follow her. What we did, we did what we thought was right. Sometimes it was wrong. And we made many, many mistakes on the air. When Channel 12 went in, they were ready professional they were that was tv honey as it should have been from the beginning but we had to kind of grow up with so it and make the mistakes they didn't have to start at the front end of the learning curve no they <laughs> did not no really and that's sad yeah. in a way that we had no idea how we looked we had no monitors you know nothing you know the, except one poor director and we couldn't even see him they had him in a hole well that that director uh, that we may be well one thinking about is uh, Winsor Bissell. oh honey you know if I had a lot of money and I would died tomorrow I'd leave it all to him he was the man that kept it all together now he will be the first one to say please don't say that mm -hmm. he didn't want any any praise at all he put the show together. He helped us pick the songs. He tell us about makeup, clothes, stand here, but in a beautiful, kind, kind way. Never get over there, you know, that, whatever they say. You know mm. what they say when they say. You know what they say. Well, uh, live television required a lot of rehearsing before you went on the air. Yeah. Because you, you had to make sure that the cameras were in the right place and you knew where people were going to go and so forth. And, and he was in charge of all of that. He did everything. Bissell, but see, he was the best man because he was not a demanding. Now, we had a few directors that were mm -hmm. blank, blank, meaning bad, you know, bad, bad. Mm -hmm. But he was kind, gentle. He would lead the booth. A mile away. We didn't never saw the director. It was so high up above us, and it was the glass, you know, covered his. We didn't see any of that. And again, uh, he was kind of making it up as he went along. Oh. because who did he have to learn it from? He had to just kind of learn it. But you he... had to know him to understand that he was a gentle kind of a guy, because a hyper kind of a guy would be yelling. We could hear some of them yelling, "Get that!" You know what that. And he'd be upstairs yelling, get that, you know, so we could hear all that Bissell. Never. Mm -hmm. Kindly, he would tell the man, like Harry Calcanus or any of them were on the floor, to be sure and tell her that her skirt is pulled up or pull it down. <laughs> oh, this is falling down, or very gently. So they'd give us a signal, or the camera would walk, you know, move away from us so that we could adjust whatever was wrong. But that's how it would work. We worked with each other. If we mm -hmm. didn't help each other, it wouldn't have lasted. If you had a man that came in and said, you do it my way, it wouldn't have worked. We did it our way with, with instructions from a man who knew what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't tell me how to sing, but I knew that. He'd tell me how to walk, this faces the camera. That was great from a director's point of view. But none of them were de <clears throat> demanding or insisted on or nothing like that. You weren't in the news department, but let's uh, talk for a moment about uh, a legendary figure at Channel 4, Bill Grove. What more can I say? Yeah. I mean, uh, he, Top man. again, kind of launched a news department where there had been nothing. And it became a major force for change. In Jacksonville. And do you know, Oz, he was a man that was kind and gentle and not, you know, a big shot. But I know the news and you can't tell me what to do and I know it all. He was a very gentle man. He knew the news. He knew what to do, what he expected on the air. 
of what he got on the air, but in a very easygoing way. That's what made the news department mm -hmm. in those days. They didn't have all the machines and the pshh. Can you go in a, new, in a newsroom today? You, can, you can't talk. No, they didn't and, have... I mean, you can't hear a thing. They didn't have film. They, they had Nothing. maybe a few still photos. I mean, it's, you go in, you think, what room is this, you know? Those days, there was one little... You took out what you needed to have, what made the news. He would delete. He would uh, accept this, take that. Gentle, it takes that kind of an easygoing guy. I don't know any of the newsmen, so I'm not talking about any of them. Mm -hmm. But he was perfect for early television. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a news show, as I told you. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, you know, feminine side of the, who wants, who cares about the feminine side of the news? <laughs> I thought, man, I'm, I'm a newswoman. I called Mama. I'm on the news now. Mama said, yay. I told everybody she's on the news now. And I had to pick up everything that said, and today I cooked a corned beef cabbage. And I thought, oh man, this is new. Well, your, uh, your first love and, and continu continuing was, uh, was uh, singing. Absolutely. And they gave me a show, uh, 7 o'clock at night and 11 o'clock at night. On Channel 4? On Channel 4. Uh -huh. My theme was... Picture a penthouse way up in the sky With hinges on chimneys For stars to go by And then Dick Stratton would say, Gleam! I think, does he have to yell? Gleam! <laughs> the Virginia Adder Show! And then Bissell, Windsor Bissell, the best director in the world, he'd play a tape that went, da 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 Oh, man! So that's how I went on the air. And twice then, a day. Twice a day. And then the piano would give me the introduction, and then I'd start singing two songs, and then they'd hit a commercial on tape. And then I'd come back and do another song. And, and Stratton was the announcer. Was this a 15-minute show? 15-minute show, three times a week. Hmm. How about that? And uh, was it just singing, or did you interview people? Or? Uh, oh, please. You don't think I was going to give anybody a chance to talk? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was your show, you were going to... <laughs> it was a 15-minute musical show, yeah. let me put it that way. Yeah. And we brought guests in that were, you know, uh, that sang or, uh, you know, I don't know what, played a guitar or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that, as long as it was a musical. But it was a 15-minute musical show. Yeah, it was fun. But well, you, Harry, I have to say, Harry Reagan is one of the nicest young men I have ever worked with. Hush up, I know well, he's dying to shut me up and I'm not going to. The, the but only... he's very talented in television, radio, and everything that he does in this town, he's the best there is. And I love him. Well, well thank you very much. And the, uh, the, the questionable part of that statement was the young man part, but... The... <laughs> what man? But thank you very much for that. The young man, you're a young man. <clears throat> well, th well, thanks. Okay. Never say any other word. It's ugly. I always say I'm a young man. Right. I always say I'm a young woman. They all know, say, she can't be young. I knew, I saw her. You know what year that was? And they tell me while I walk every morning, by the way. Mm. I walk down First Street every morning, Jacksonville Beach, and Neptune Beach. Well, Virginia, thank you very much for doing this. Can we do uh, it again? In yeah. I won't be here in 10 years. <laughs> so don't expect that. <laughs> But maybe in the next couple, if I keep taking care of myself. We can always come back uh, some other time and do part two. Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah. That was an oral history interview with Virginia Adder Keys. Thanks for watching the Jackson Mill History Show. You can see other oral history interviews with broadcasting pioneers at the Jacksonville Historical Society's website, www.jackshistory.com. So long, everyone.